Who was Laura Sanderson? Um, I first met Miss Sanderson while um, Allison Bell and Maida Goodwin and I were working on the Roaring Brook exhibit downstairs. Um, and I think we all found her kind of interesting, but nobody really had time to look into her and her story. And then um, I happened to be in Indiana visiting my sister in March. Um, Miss Sanderson spent the second half of her life in Indiana. That was a spoiler. And I kind of ran into her again in a weird way and thought, I really want to learn more about this woman. Um, so let me tell you about her. But let's think for a minute first about what living for these 98 years meant. She lived through the Civil War, both world wars. She saw trolleys, automobiles, and telephones introduced. She lived through the Spanish flu and the Great Depression. She was finally allowed to vote in 1920 when she was 69 years old. Um, she had quite a life. I don't know if other of us, others of us will be able to say that. Um, she also never married and never had children at a time when only about 10% of American women chose that path in life. And sadly, as far as we know, if she kept any journals, none of them have been found. So all of my talk is going to be in the words of other people or through newspaper accounts. We don't have her, Laura Sanderson's own words. Laura was the daughter of Elon Chester Sanderson and Abby Rice Sanderson. Um, we have no portrait of Abby. She, had, she was the eldest of five siblings, one of whom died as an infant. She grew up on Glen Road, and everything we see suggests that she had a really wonderful life living there in Waitley Glen. We use the account books of her uncle and father and a journal kept by her mother and sister Maddie. They're actually wonderful. Paper was expensive, and they're written on the reverse sides of each other. They're over in the library at PVMA. And everything that I read suggests that her family recognized her intelligence and talent from the beginning. Um, they made choices about how to invest. Her sister Maddie writes, Laura and I done up the chores. Then Laura studied. I sewed. Laura practiced the piano for two hours. She was sent to an expensive private school in Bernardston, the Powers Institute. This building is still in Bernardston, if you want to visit it. Each payment for tuition and transportation is carefully noted in her father's account book. This was a pretty big investment. And soon afterwards, she started her career as a teacher and principal in the Waitley and Deerfield schools, and she worked for those two school systems for 20 years. Then the family scene shifted. Her sister Maddie married Frank Ward in 1877, this is their wedding photos, and moved to Deerfield. And Laura stayed in her parents' house. But in 1884, I thought this was interesting, when her father died, he did not leave his house to his wife. He left it to the youngest son, George Elon Sanderson. This photograph is really wonderful, and you won't be able to see what I'm about to describe, 1888. It probably shows Laura's mother, Abby, the woman in the dark dress on the porch. There are two men in the right center who I think are probably Laura's brothers, Charles and George. And Laura is seated on the ground under the large tree there on the left. She's holding two black and white kittens, and the family dog is in the shadows right next to her. We have this photograph in the Historical Society if you want to see it in a way that's legible. So very happy family. Then the next year, the very next year, Frank Ward died, and Laura's sister Maddie was left a widow after only 12 years of marriage. She stayed in Deerfield with her four-year-old son, William, but her sister Laura was nearby, and they had a very close relationship. And then some newcomers came to town. The famed painter and photographer Elbridge Kingsley led a posse of artists, many from Brooklyn, to the Waitley Glen each summer beginning in the 1880s. Some of them stayed, or at least dined, with the Sanderson family. The Sanderson house would have been the only house up there in Waitley Glen at that time. And Elbridge wrote in his journal, the daughter of the Sanderson family on the hill developed much literary skill, and she had a warm interest in the work of both Mr. Davis and myself. Uh, a well-known painter, 
John Parker Davis wrote, the daughter of the house rides up, bringing news of the world and an evening of pure delight to us car dwellers. This is the Kingsley car, which is big enough for people to sleep in, or was big enough for people to sleep in. It's pretty easy to imagine how much Laura would have enjoyed conversations about art and nature and who knows what else with these guys. They would have brought a lot to her life. This Kingsley photograph, which was titled Women in Waitley Glen, we believe is a portrait of Laura Sanderson. I owe this to Maida Goodwin, who said, it is the same profile <laughs> as that early photograph we saw. It absolutely is the same nose. Meanwhile, Laura's um, career as a poet flourished. She had a major work titled Wee Quamps, the native name for Sugarloaf, that was published in two issues of New England Magazine. And she wrote this, this was really her style, lyrical, nostalgic poem about her hometown that is in the Waitley Glen chapter in James Craft's History of Waitley, which she wrote. So now Laura is 45 years old, and it, her life takes a major new, she chooses a major new direction. We don't know why. In 1894, she suddenly chose to take a course in shorthand at the Child's Business College in Springfield, and she contributed a poem for the graduation program. We think she must have taken the train from Waitley to Springfield and back. The trolley wasn't operating till 1903, and I don't know how she managed to balance her teaching schedule with these classes, um, but it probably was quite a commitment of time. Then, there are a lot of thens in this story. In 1898, her brother George married Clara Dickinson. Maybe Laura had seen this coming, but suddenly she decided to leave the house she'd lived in for 48 years and set out on her own. And she moved to Indianapolis. Waitley, in 1899, had fewer than 800 residents, half the size of our you know, booming metropolis now. <laughs> Indianapolis had 170,000 people. It was three times the size of Springfield, which may have been the largest city Laura had visited. I, it's possible she went to Boston or, or New York, but we don't know that. She would have arrived at the train station, Union Station in um, Indianapolis. is really gorgeous, that neo-Romanesque uh, structure, and it's still there. The train ride from Springfield to Chicago and then Indianapolis takes 32 hours now. So I'm guessing it took a few days. So this was, this was just unbelievable that she took off on her own and made this move. Um, I included just, Indianapolis is a city that really likes its monuments. The Soldiers and Sail Sailors Monument, which was built in 1898, is only 15 feet shorter than the Statue of Liberty. It is, it is substantial. Um, so she stayed in Indianapolis and seems to have become sort of a prodigal daughter for the whole community here. She came home for the first time in 1902 and the Greenfield Gazette reported on her visit. Miss Sanderson has been in Indianapolis three years and this is her first visit east. She went to Indianapolis as a teacher in Voorhees Business College and later opened a business school of her own, which is very successful and open all the year. She intended to bury her driving horse pet while here, but at the last minute she just couldn't do it as the horse is good for some time yet. Pet was one of the finest driving horses in these parts when Miss Sanderson was a school mom and drove over the hills and through the valleys of Franklin County. She went back to Indianapolis, and four months later, her mother, Abby, died. I don't think Laura was able to come back from, for the funeral. Um, I'm going to read you this excerpt from the mother's will. Not forgetting my sons, Charles A. Sanderson and George E. Sanderson, and believing they have received a just and equitable forfeiture of my estate from me heretofore, to my daughters, Martha A. Ward and Laura A. Sanderson, all my estate, both real and personal, to which I may be entitled at the time of my death. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> the estate um, divided in half was valued, thank you, Derricka, at less than $3,000. 
but Laura's share may have been helpful as she was building her business in Indiana. In 1907, eight years after her move, Laura was featured in a very long article in the Indianapolis Star about women-owned businesses. The photo on the left appeared in that article. There's that nose again. <laughs> um, let's see, at this point she was 56 years old. The article began with Madam C.J. Walker, the first woman in the U.S. to build a business worth more than $1 million. And her story is really a great story, but I won't tell it now. But Waitley's Laura came second, and the piece includes the only example of Laura's own voice other than her poetry that I have found. The newspaper article reads, there is only one woman in Indianapolis who is proprietor of a business college. Miss Laura A. Sanderson started her school in 1900 with one pupil and $25. Now, today, now she has a flourishing establishment with all the pupils she can take care of. I came from the East, said Miss Sanderson, to teach in a business college here. When I quit teaching, I didn't have so very much money and I didn't want to go back to the East. I concluded to start a school of my own and now I'm glad that I did. I um, found dozens and dozens of advertisements for the school in Indianapolis newspapers over a 40 year period. Many of them advertised for male, male students, um, was not only a women's program, and of course, working in an office was actually a respectable, you know, professional job at that point. Several boasted the important addition of touch typing to the curriculum. Um, I, well, I had to learn that in high school. I bet some of you did too. But my favorite, this one on the right, is from a short-lived journal called the Hoosier Suffragist, and it appeared in 1918. The woman portrayed is not Laura. She's a model, I guess. <laughs> One of the things that gives me the impression that the school was really a going concern is that the first two locations of the school were signature buildings. The one on the left is the Merchants Bank building designed by Daniel Burnham, who built most of the buildings in the loop in Chicago, it was the tallest in Indianapolis. And then at some point, she moved to the Lemke building, which is also kind of a lovely building, a couple of blocks away. But I have to say, even though these were probably high rent locations and suggest that she was doing really well, it's actually hard to say how well the school did. Um, with the help of three different research librarians in Indiana, we just haven't found anything in the way of business records that could really tell us what the scale of her organization was. Um, lots of glowing accounts in the newspaper, lots of reports of graduates going on to good jobs, one by one by one, um, but nothing really concrete. I think the depression must have been tough because the school's advertisements became smaller and smaller and smaller in the 30s, and, and the school moved several more times, and I assume that was to contain costs. This is... Uh, the house where Laura lived, 1102 Sterling Street. It's in, um, Indianapolis is a city that has many residential neighborhoods within its boundaries. This one is about two miles from the central business district, so she could have walked or taken the trolley to work. I found the house on Zillow. There is very little of the 1907 house remaining other than a really nice banister and a nice tiled uh, fireplace around. Um, but this is the way the neighborhood would have been organized. That it's a it's a private house to the left too. That's a little harder to tell. And I wonder what it would have been like for her to live so close to her neighbors, having spent the first half of her life in the Sanderson Mansion up on Glen Road. Re really, really different. Um, in 1916, the widowed Maddie Ward moved to Indianapolis to live with her sister. Um, they must have been thrilled when Maddie's 17-year-old granddaughter, Eva, came in uh, to study at the Sanderson Business College after she graduated Deerfield Academy in 1926. But then Maddie died in 1933. The story gets really bad from right now, so I might need a Kleenex in a few minutes. And, and that must have been pretty bad. So um, Laura was 82. She accompanied Maddie's body home by train, and Maddie was buried in Deerfield. And then Laura returned alone in Indianapolis. 
And then Laura's only living sibling, George Sanderson, died in 1940, so no one was left here in Waitley. In 1942, Laura was admitted to the Central State Hospital, a public insane asylum in Indianapolis. This, the women's building, which was about five times the size of the men's building, was known as the Seven Steeples. It was torn down in the 1970s, but the hospital operated until 1994 when it closed amid accusations of patient abuse. Laura was admitted by a neighbor and this man, her guardian, James McLemore. We really don't like him, but just <laughs> stay with me for a few minutes. Um, McLemore was born in San Antonio. I, I don't know why he moved to Indiana. He began to practice law in 36 at the age of 42. The obvious question was, where did they find each other? I figured out that his office was in the People's Bank building in 1940 42, as was the Sanderson School at that time. So they may have been office neighbors. Uh, Attorney McLemore was not a success. He lost every case I found reported on the internet. He probably won some cases, but... And he ran twice for the Indianapolis State Senate and lost both times. What he really seemed to care about is that he was an accomplished amateur ma magician. And here he is on the cover of something called Genie Magazine in 1942, the year he put Laura in the asylum. I really do want to find out the circumstances of the guardianship, but it looks like that will require going to Indianapolis and getting somebody to help. Because I haven't been able to do it online. Okay, let's forget about McLemore for a moment and go back to the hospital. Um, we um, have obtained Laura's hospital admissions records. Gary Sanderson and Derek Smith and I collaborated. We didn't actually lie, but, <laughs> but we took, um, was it 11 generations? In order to prove that Gary Sanderson was the, of course, uh, relative, we took Derricka's wonderfully detailed gen genealogy and traced back, I think it was 11 generations. Um, anyway, it was good, it was worth doing. The, the, the records are shocking. Um, a neighbor, her neighbor, Laura Parks, uh, they'd lived next door to one another for 32 years, reported that 91-year-old Laura was wandering the neighborhood and had become cranky since having pneumonia and losing her eyesight. She had an unnatural affection for cats and avoided humans, and that she had suffered great mental shock when her guardian disposed of some of her cats. Everyone in the room has had a dog or a cat or a horse and just needs to think about that for a moment. <laughs> um, the admitting physician's handwritten notes are very detailed. Laura was four foot ten and weighed 89 pounds when she was admitted. Her eyes were young looking for her age. Her hearing was normal. She had lost her teeth, as many people would have at that point. He says, the patient talks intelligently and sounds convincing, but apparently some statements of her former activities are wrong. For instance, she states that she ran her business up to one year ago, but this is apparently wrong. Well, it wasn't wrong because in the 1940 Indianapolis City Directory, there it is, Sanderson Business College, Laura A. Sanderson, proprietor. Um, he was lazy. The doctor concluded the patient did not exhibit the mental disturbances that the neighbor had described. She has undoubtedly been a very intelligent woman who is doubtless deteriorating and her mental disturbances are probably more apparent at certain times. In other words, he took the word of others rather than the evidence of his own examination. Judge Earl R. Cox signed the order of commitment and Laura spent the last seven years of her life in Central State Hospital. When Laura died in 1949, her body was shipped home to Waitley. Her grave in the center cemetery is marked with a small granite headstone, the one over to the left and so that you can see it more on the right, adjacent to those of her parents, her sister Abby, and her brother Charles. 
We found the Waitley Cemetery Commissioner's handwritten records that show the opening of a grave, but not the record of the payment. So we don't know who paid for this to happen. The only things that occur to me is that perhaps James McLemore used some of Laura's remaining funds for this purpose, or Maddie's son William and his daughter Eva may have paid for it, although they were both working for the Ward family's lumber business in the Adirondacks at the time, so we don't know, but somehow she got home. So there you have it, the three lives of Laura Sanderson. Um, I want to thank again Maida Goodwin, Gary Sanderson, and Derricka Smith because they were all great about helping to untangle various mysteries. Um, three great research librarians in Indiana who just answered questions as much as they could. And thank you for listening. So before we take questions,